Marsin is also a research associate at CPR, a research advisor at DCB, and co-editor of the Review of Asset Pricing Studies and the Review of Finance. And he is the former president of the European Finance Association. Um, we have not seen the keynote speech. Uh, we know that it deals with the green finance. We are very excited to be listening to this keynote speech, as is the audience. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Marcin. Much for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to talk to you all. Uh, I wish I could be with you. Uh, sadly, teaching semesters are not always easy to coordinate around. So let me share the slides and uh, hopefully this is going to be uh, smooth. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about today is uh, some of the recent research I have been conducting with uh, my colleague uh, Patrick Bolton and a student of ours at Imperial College, uh, Moritz Wiedemann. And broadly speaking, it fits in, in a broader uh, research agenda that I have been involved in over the last uh, couple of years. And it relates to, it relates to issues that uh, European Central Bank and other central banks have been very involved in, and it's the uh, question of uh, how to control the uh, so-called uh, climate uh, change or climate uh, crisis. So, in general, we have more and more evidence from scientists telling us that uh, this is a real problem. I think at this point, uh, very few people question the fact that we observe some real changes in the atmosphere that are consistent with the idea that uh, the planet is uh, overheating and the problem with that of course is that it may become uh, dire and dangerous for human livings and as such uh, this is actually one of the key uh, social issues uh, that we need to deal with for the next uh, decades to come and it's kind of interesting to observe that uh, the policy makers the regulators have actually embarked on this mission and i must say that european central bank is clearly one of the leaders in that particular uh, space. The question always that becomes important is how do we address this problem? And the first thing to recognize is that one of the things that uh, is potentially responsible for the global warming is essentially the scope of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we emit uh, as a society. There is a pretty well-established evidence that uh, these emissions are pretty much uh, man-made. Any kind of uh, naturally made uh, emissions we can show are not really uh, causally affecting the temperature changes. And what's important about these emissions, and this is due to the Nobel Prize winners from 2021, uh, Hasselman and Manabe, is that there is actually a link that the more we emit, the more we are affecting uh, temperatures. So in some sense, as policymakers, we really cannot control uh, temperatures directly but we can definitely have an impact on the scope of uh, emissions that at least uh, people are emitting into the atmosphere. So that has uh, essentially created a framework that is called the decarbonization policies. There are quite a few of different uh, decarbonization policies which largely concentrate on one specific goal, which is that uh, the global uh, emission levels should actually get reduced to something that is close to zero by a mid 21st century which uh, originally was ca capped at 2050 these days this date is a little bit more uh, flexible but we still are talking about uh, about a similar time uh, horizon uh, to think about the emissions so the question is how do we go there how do we go from the time when we currently emit 40 gigatons of emissions as a society to the world in which we emit zero so there are many ways to think about it. The simplest way is to simply restrict economic activity. So we had a little bit of a natural experiment of that during the COVID episode in 2020. What we have actually done is uh, global economy has pretty much reduced by 30% of its uh, activity. And the result of that was essentially the decreases of emissions that we would like to observe for the next uh, 30 years up to 2050. And of course, that's great because that's what the climate scientists would like to observe. But we also know that the consequences of uh, the lockdowns that uh, we had to impose on the society were actually quite severe. So the trade-off of how much you can actually stop the economic growth is versus how much we want to reduce emissions 
it's, it's actually not obvious to everyone. So what's the alternative view that people hold? People think that we can kind of grow out of this problem through innovation. So this is a very popular view that essentially rather than producing energy using the fossil fuel intensive technologies, what we can aspire to have is the world in which we actually achieve the same kind of energy output without uh, any greenhouse gas footprint. So that's uh, what uh, many people have been thinking about, and they think that this is where the world should go. But essentially, this uh, process or this uh, uh, framework makes certain assumptions. Essentially, what we are assuming here is that innovation in the green spectrum indeed leads to decarbonization. But in fairness, there is no really evidence that tells us that it should be a priori. So in some sense, what I wanted to tell you about today is how much we can actually believe in that process based on the data that we already observe in terms of innovation and the decarbonization of different uh, companies and different countries. So the perspective I wanna show you today is going to be a global perspective where we are going to look at a large spectrum of, uh, of uh, companies uh, in the uh, world. And we will try to see to what extent uh, innovation in the green energy space potentially leads to some kind of uh, response in terms of the decarbonization of these economies. So just to put some framework on this question, there are kind of two views to think about this particular problem. The dominant view is the economist view, which essentially says that if we innovate more in the green space, that's going to translate to investment in green technologies. And what we are going to observe is the reduction in carbon footprint. So this has been a view that was, for example, advocated by Philippa Guillon and co-authors. Recent paper by Lauren Cohen and co-authors makes similar points. And the implicit in this is the idea that uh, so-called polluting firms, so brown firms, are gonna change from carbon intensive production to renewable production, or alternatively, they are going to improve efficiency of their uh, brown uh, technology such that the carbon footprint is kind of lower. So this is uh, what this uh, studies or this uh, lead of uh, literature postulates. But there is another view that is actually less emphasized, that is something potentially interesting, which is the view that is consistent with something that economists call the Jevons paradox. So essentially the idea is that if we come up with a very efficient technology, think about producing energy in a much more uh, energy efficient way, say companies that are using coal now are gonna emit less in this process, what this is going to create is essentially increased demand for the product. And as such, it's no longer obvious that the total carbon footprint that the economy is gonna produce is actually gonna be a reduction. Because even though on the per unit basis, we may actually indeed emit less because the consumption and productions go up, the total amount of emissions that we may be responsible for is actually gonna be the other way around. And this has been noted by Jevons in 19th century when he talked about the coal industry. He talked about uh, the United Kingdom and was talking about how to essentially make uh, coal production more efficient. And he pointed that paradox and call it a carbon question. So in the spirit of Jevons, we wanna think of the debate over the decarbonization process as a CO2 question. So as I said, we are going to look at that uh, trade-off from the global perspective, and we are gonna envision the data from 81 different countries spanning all sectors that uh, essentially constitute economies. We're gonna look at a fairly long time period and especially a period where a lot of activities in the decarbonization policies have been present. So we are looking at 2005 to 2020. And there are three questions that we are interested in addressing here. The first one is this notion of innovation, which is what kind of companies innovate in green space? And do we observe that companies change the mix in which they innovate? meaning companies originally innovate in brown space and then out of a sudden they switch to innovating in the green space. The second question is the consequence of that. So the question is, even if we observe green innovation, do we observe that that actually leads to, lead decar to uh, decarbonization or can we actually see maybe some evidence that is consistent with the Jevons paradox? And the final question is more of the welfare question or more general equilibrium question, which is 
If there is an innovation that is produced at the firm level, do we observe that this innovation actually potentially benefits other companies such that we can see that decarbonization is not just a function of who innovates, but who actually benefits from that particular output uh, indirectly? So the data that we are going to look at to inform these questions is the data that comes from Orbis uh, Intellectual Property and Financial. So the broad data set is actually very rich. It has information about innovation activity of both public and private firms. And it also has information about a lot of uh, different fundamentals of these companies. But we are going to match this information with the information on patent data which of course assumes that companies need to have some innovation activity. And what's interesting about the data we have is that we will be able to trace the ownership of these patents and also the filing system by which the patent has been actually recognized. And it's important to know that in the patenting uh, kind of framework, patents can be registered with different uh, places. So US Patent Office, Japanese Patent Office, or European Patent Office are three main kind of places where the patents can be registered. A little digression on that, the European Patent Office is the most strict of all three in terms of what needs to be recognized as an important innovation in that space. And then we are going to look at uh, this data and contrast it with the data on emissions. So this is the data that comes from S&P Global True Cost and the data that many people have used in the past, including my work and also people at ECB. And that data is going to give us information on firm level emissions, both direct and indirect emissions. So just to give you a couple of summary statistics, in the data we are going to have more than 11,000 global publicly listed uh, companies with financial uh, patent and emission data. Five and a half thousand of these companies, roughly speaking, are going to have at least one green patent and 2,800 are going to have at least one brown patent. And the number of patents that these companies jointly produce is actually quite large. We have uh, actually more than an eight and a half million patents that jointly are produced by these companies. Here you see a couple of other statistics in the interest of time. I just want to mention that essentially the average patenting activity is pretty rich. It's 755 patents uh, per firm on average. And per year it's more than 60 patents. So there are companies that actually patent uh, quite a lot. And what's important is that this patenting activity by and large is pretty stable over time. Although I'm gonna show you some pictures that kind of indicate that maybe the recent uh, period that has been a little bit declining uh, in the data. So important for our consideration is the definition of a patent. What constitutes a green patent? What constitutes the brown efficiency patent? So we spent a lot of time trying to conclusively characterize these patents. So there are many different classifications in which you can do it. There are four classifications that we have jointly utilized to actually characterize the patents. OECD, IPC Green Inventory, Fossil Fuel Efficiency Improving Classes, and the Corporate Knights Clean 200. So broad broadly, green patents are going to be defined as technologies that may substitute carbon dioxide uh, emitting te uh, technologies for carbon-free technologies. Brown efficiency patents are technologies that improve essentially the process of producing energy. So you can think of a company that is still polluting, but it's actually polluting with a much lower rate per unit of energy production. So as I said, we are going to distinguish between patents from different sources. In my analysis, I'm going to show you results for the European Patent Office. And as I said, these are probably the most uh, representative results given the stringency of the uh, patenting process in the European uh, area. And what we are going to look at uh, in general is the activity of uh, patenting in both green and uh, brown space relative to the total amount of activity. But we are also going to look at citations of patents and we are also going to look at the total output of patents. So here are a couple of pictures again to summarize the data. So the top picture shows you what's the average uh, representation of uh, green patents relative to all patents across firms over time. And you can see that this ratio for green patents is pretty stable and it's roughly speaking seven to eight uh, percent. What you see here is now how the green patents compared to brown patents across different regions. 
So in the top panel, you see the full sample. In the bottom panel, you see the sample that is merged with the emission data from true cost. And what you see is essentially the information which is pretty consistent across different regions, meaning we have increased in the patenting activity in total, which means that companies in general innovate more. But recently, there is a little bit of a decline in all jurisdictions in terms of how much patents are being registered with the European office. So let me now tell you how it is that we're going to go around testing the three questions that I have mentioned in the beginning. So as I said, the first question that informs our study is the question of what type of companies are involved in this green versus brown efficiency patenting? Are they actually changing their profile over time? Is there some systematic relationship to any characteristics that predicts where we should expect the innovation to come? And then the subsequent two questions are related to what's the effect of this activity on and the first order problem, which is the decarbonization problem. So we are going to look at future emissions relative to the patenting activity today, recognizing the fact that actually it may take time from the time when the company launches the particular technology until the time when actually this is producing a particular output in terms of reduced emissions scope. And then we will also look at a couple of different corporate fundamentals to see whether anything changes in the way how these companies operate. So on the first question, here is the first look at the data. So what I'm showing you here is essentially two aspects. We are looking at the effect of uh, the size of emission of a company and its age on its propensity to innovate in the green space. So we are looking at these patents that essentially are not producing any fossil fuels. And what you see here are two very interesting facts. Fact number one, that's the red uh, box of this slide is that younger companies are more likely to innovate in the green space, which to some extent is not super surprising, but it kind of tells you what role actually new technologies and new companies play in this particular uh, framework. So most of the green innovation essentially comes from the entrance, not from the fact that the old companies actually produce more green innovation. The second interesting fact is the observation that actually, if you look at the relationship between the green patenting and the level of firm's emissions, and I want you to look at column four, which is the multivariate column, you find that companies which have higher emissions on average patent more. But it turns out that this is purely an industry fixed effect, meaning this is just simply a function of the fact that certain industries are actually uh, not uh, patenting at all, or certain industries uh, don't have any emissions at all. So what it actually suggests is that it's very important to fix the industry and understand how that within industry variation looks like. And if you do that, and we do it in column five, essentially what you find is that companies which are larger polluters are the ones that actually innovate less which tells you that there is some kind of path dependency going on here, in a sense that if you are a green company, you are more likely to produce green innovation in that space. But what's important about that, and that's related to one of the motivating questions, and this is what we see in column six, that it's not that the company reducing emissions leads to actually producing more patents. It's more of a selection question. In a sense, certain companies are the type of companies that are always going to be green innovators and other companies, those with higher emissions, are companies which are not the green innovators. How do we see that? If we control for firm specific fixed effects, that effect essentially disappears, which tells you that companies that reduce emissions themselves, they are not uh, suddenly actually producing more green patents at the same time. So we look at the same question from the perspective of brown efficiency patents. And we find exactly the polar kind of evidence to that, which is we find that now the older companies are actually more responsible for the brown efficiency patents. And the companies which have higher emissions are actually the companies which uh, are producing more brown innovation. So this is, again, very much consistent with this path dependency story. In some, we do not observe switchers from someone who was initially a brown efficiency innovator to someone who is a green efficiency innovator. And another way to see it is through this particular table. So what we see here is that essentially the stock of patents that have been produced by the companies in the past, either green or brown patents, 
are strong predictors of their patenting activity today. You can see it for both the green and the brown patents. So essentially, if you have been actually involved in the patenting activity in the past of a one type, you are more likely to continue on that path rather than actually switch your profile. So in other words, if we hope that the economies are going to become more green kind of oriented, the hope is more coming from companies which are young and the companies which have actually been doing this kind of activity over time. So now let me switch to the second question, which is, what is the consequence of that? So of course, there is a lot of discussion about, should we subsidize patenting activity? Should we subsidize innovation? And the underlying assumption of that kind of question is, we believe that this activity is going to benefit the decarbonization kind of constraint. And as I told you, there are two ways to think about it. The Aguillon approach is to say, yes, activity in innovation in green space is going to lead to the larger investment in that particular space and subsequently decarbonization. But alternatively, you can think about uh, the Jevons paradox and essentially think about uh, the reduction or improvement in technology as essentially being reflected in some other parts of the decarbonization. So there are two examples I want to give you here. One example is Tesla. So we all know that Tesla is extremely uh, good in terms of the green innovation in a sense that uh, it doesn't produce uh, carbon emissions in terms of downstream uh, scope fee because the Tesla cars are fully electric cars. But what we sometimes recognize less is that Tesla actually has pretty high upstream scope free emissions, meaning the components that produce Tesla are actually utilizing quite a lot of fossil fuels. And on top of that, when we recharge the Tesla car, it's not obvious where that energy actually comes from. So ideally, we would like to use the renewable energy, but of course that source of power does not distinguish where the energy necessarily comes from. As such, you are also responsible for larger scope two emissions. So that's one kind of unintended consequence of promoting Tesla. We essentially are gonna shift the production of emissions from one place to another place. And there are interesting studies that suggest that you need to drive quite a lot of Tesla to actually go to the point where the level of emissions in total is gonna be less than the standard combustible engine car. The second story is the story of Iceland. So many of you are familiar, of course, with Iceland. And one thing for which Iceland is actually known is the production of energy from the geothermal sources. So you go to Iceland, you see a lot of that production. What's less known is that essentially that efficiency of energy production has attracted a very large concentration of the aluminum industry in Iceland. So essentially you are offering a free kind of good energy quality, but at the same time you are sparing activity which is very emission intensive. The aluminum production is actually fairly actually brown in the way how it operates. So essentially both of these issues are manifestations of the Jevons paradox that I have mentioned before. And of course, the case of Tesla and the case of Iceland need not to be representative uh, uh, cases. As such, it's important to study this in more detail. So this is the evidence that I want to show you on that front. What we are looking at here is essentially the impact of innovation uh, in green and brown space on the subsequent emissions one year and three years later. So in the top panel, you see what happens one year later. In the bottom panel, you see what happens three years later. And the variables of interest I want you to look at are the total level of emissions. These are the first three columns, and this is the log scale, scope one, scope two, and scope three. And the next three columns show you the intensity metrics, which are essentially emissions scaled by the size of the revenues of these companies. And what's interesting to observe from these panels is essentially that we don't observe any visible reduction in emissions in the future, conditional on the companies patenting today. So we don't see that companies actually that innovate more are subsequently polluting less. If anything, we find a little bit of evidence that the scope three emissions go higher. And that's a little bit consistent with the story of Tesla that I have mentioned to you. Of course, it is statistically insignificant, but the economic magnitudes that are not small. But if anything, it's very hard to argue for this evidence that this is actually leading to reduction in emissions. If anything, we go to higher emissions rather than lower emissions, 
And I don't have the results here, but if you look five years back, the same kind of uh, picture pa is painted. So the five year period is not enough for these companies to show any visible decarbonization effect. If you look at the same question from the perspective of brown efficiency, you find even more evidence consistent with the Jevons paradox, especially in the bottom uh, slide, you see the effect on uh, emissions uh, coming from three years before brown efficiency patenting. And you see that as a result of that, emissions, direct emissions of companies on average go up, which is exactly what Jevons predicted, that companies that become more efficient in the brown technology are going to attract more demand, and as such, they are going to produce more. So in total, the emissions are going to go up. And this is nicely illustrated if you look at intensity, because the measure of intensity actually doesn't have such a high increase relative to the level, which tells you that it must be the case that revenues go up at the same time, which is exactly what the Jevons paradox is. So we look also at this question from the perspective of citations of patents. You could argue that maybe just looking at the stock of patents is not good because patents are different in terms of their quality. And the short answer to that question is, even if we look at well-cited patents, it's still the case that those patents don't predict a reduction in uh, carbon production. And it's true the same way for the brown efficiency patents as well. So now we've done a couple of different robustness tests in the interest of time, I'm going to skip those. But instead, I want to move to a couple of explanations of why it is pot potentially the case that we do not observe these results in the data. So there are a number of ideas that you could put on the table. The first one could be that simply we are in the early stages of this process. And it takes time for the innovation to actually materialize in a kind of real sense. So it might be that we need to innovate more or maybe the process of converting innovation into output, it takes longer than what I have shown you. But remember five year period, it's a pretty long period. So if, if that is the story, it is a pretty actually negative NPV proposition if we need to wait longer than five years to actually see the benefit of that particular action. The other possibility is that maybe these patents are simply not important enough. Maybe the innovation we observe right now is still not good enough such that it can be launched at a large scale and it's going to lead to visible improvements in terms of uh, emissions. Of course, it's hard to measure that. The citation kind of results was the step in that direction we didn't find actually evidence of that. Another explanation is, uh, of course, the Jevons paradox. So I've already talked about that. Another one is that maybe companies actually are conglomerate companies and essentially R&D activity is just a small part of their operations, but emissions come actually from different uh, sources. So we tried to look at this directly and we, sh and we saw that even if you look at the standalone companies, that don't have this kind of diversified operation, the same type of results qualitatively uh, can be seen. So it's not a story of conglomerates that drives this result. There is a slightly different story behind it. So finally, the story that is kind of the story I want to show you more evidence on is the story that maybe the innovation is not for the company itself, but it's a more of a public good in a sense that other companies, other industries can benefit from something that a given innovator produces. So in this regard, we want to look at the story of spillovers, of innovation to other companies, to other sectors uh, in this particular uh, framework. So let me tell you what we are looking at here. We are going to look at innovation as a kind of clustering process. So we will try to ask the question, to what extent innovation of one firm in an industry spills over to innovation in other firms in the same industry? So the idea essentially is that uh, this is the most direct connection by which one company can benefit from innovation of another company. And we would like to see whether this actually matters. And what's interesting is that you can distinguish between companies that are competitors in the innovation space. So these are other companies that potentially innovate versus companies that are actually are pure beneficiaries in a sense that they are just consumers of innovation rather than producers of innovation. So here is a couple of results on this particular spectrum. What you see here in this table in the top two panels is that predictability of emissions coming from uh, green innovation for companies that are also innovators in the same industry. This is what we call patenting firms. 
And in the bottom two panels, you see the effect of green innovation on companies that are not innovating in that space. So these are the non-patenting firms. And throughout all these four panels, you see that essentially none of these measures of emissions that I have introduced leads to a visible reduction. There is a little evidence on the intensity of scope three for the other patenting firms that it gets reduced. But as you can see throughout most of these results, there is not really big evidence that other companies in the same industry are benefiting from the innovation in the green space. Now we look at the same question from the brown patenting, brown efficiency. And here the picture is slightly different, kind of interesting. What we find is that among the patenting firms, actually those firms seem to reduce their emissions conditional on their rivals to actually introduce innovation. So there seems to be some spillover in terms of how these uh, other competitors in the same industry uh, engage in the innovation that is produced by their competitor. On the other hand, if you look at the non-patenting firms, those which are not competing in this particular uh, framework, you actually find evidence that is consistent with the Jevons paradox again, which is the companies that actually are in the same industry are increasing their emissions through this patenting activity rather than decreasing their emissions. And that's largely coming through the increased sales of these particular uh, companies. So just to conclude, I want uh, us all to realize that the process of uh, climate, uh, global warming, is clearly an important process to think about. And I really want to applaud all the efforts that lots of people are taking these days to actually think about this problem. But I think we also need to realize that the problem is a little bit more complex than sometimes it is presented. So the idea that we can grow to the decarbonization through innovation is potentially useful, but it has to be taken in a more nuanced way. It's not clearly the case based on the observed data that uh, comp just simply promoting innovation necessarily implies decarbonization. So just channeling resources to green companies to innovate without checking what that innovation does and what's the effect of that innovation on the output in terms of emission is probably not the best way to spend resources of the taxpayers. So there has to be a more nuanced, more concerted effort in the way how we're going to think about subsidizing these green technologies. Maybe another way to think about this is that we need to think about lowering cost of existing technologies. Maybe the idea is not to promote new technologies, but the idea rather is to make the existing technologies cheaper and more accessible for those who could potentially benefit from that. Whichever way we take, I think it's an important and interesting area to think about. And I look forward to research coming also from institutions like ECB and other central banks and academic institutions as well. And thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to any comments you may have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marcin, for a very insightful uh, keynote speech. Eh? Clearly, we will have to study um, your speech and your research very, very closely in the coming uh, days and uh, weeks and months. Eh? Um, while we wait for some uh, question from the audience, eh, remotely or or um, or in presence here, I have a couple of uh, spontaneous um, remarks. One is, I mean, I came in today thinking that innovation is good eh, and uh, will like, uh, contribute uh, to the decarbonization process. Eh? So clearly, we have also to to ascertain the behavior of companies and so forth. So my two, three spontaneous comments are, um, so you, you showed clearly that young and more established firms innovate the patent, and you focus on the case of Europe. Now, about the cross-border dimension, so do companies innovate because this is a public good, contributes to a body of research and so forth, or they increase the war chest of patents in case regulation, norms, carbon pricing sets in, so they are ready to comply to you know higher ETS prices and so forth. 
Um, so this is one one dimension. Is it the, 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 so they innovate and they could do, but they don't. And do firms face also a higher cost? I mean, companies that want to decarbonize, uh, emit uh, fewer carbon, uh, greenhouse gases, and so forth, eh? they face a cost. They become less competitive. So in that sense, if you can you look at, uh, at conglomerates, companies that uh, whose operation spans over many regions, many continents, and they are faced with different stringencies across uh, these uh, jurisdictions, and uh, so are um, multinationals less polluting in Europe, but more maybe in uh, Far East Asia or, or North or South America and so forth. That's another possibly interesting uh, question. Eh? Um, now, may, maybe a different title for your slides could be the dark side of uh, green innovation, perhaps, you know? And uh, so in terms of adoption, uh, so do you have a time series long enough that you can see how long the transmission from uh, the science the technological, the engineering side, the implementation. So how long that does do innovation take to phase in? And then the Tesla question is, I remember reading that uh, somewhere that uh, it takes maybe many years for, uh, for an electric car to run before the carbon used in its uh, production is kind of uh, neutralized, you know, somehow. So if you can elaborate on this and we wait for other questions from the from the audience. Eh? Fantastic questions. Thank you so much. Uh, so I, I hope I could briefly answer. I tried to take notes and hopefully I took uh, them in a proper way. So on the first question, I think it's a great question about essentially why are these firms uh, innovating? Are they doing it because they want to benefit uh, public good, essentially decarbonize the whole uh, economies uh, and the world? Are they doing it more as a hedging motive uh, to hedge against potential regulation? And, to, and I think both are possibilities. I fully agree with you. And essentially, our way of thinking about this question was essentially to look at this last part, which are the spillovers. Essentially, if you were expecting that uh, these companies are just doing it for their own kind of selfish reason, you would not observe any kind of effect uh, in terms of the industrial uh, activity, like other companies benefiting from that. And partly, we don't find a very strong evidence of that, to be honest with you. We don't find that the other companies are decarbonizing more, especially when it comes to green patents. So maybe it is a little bit of the story that you mentioned. I would add to the compliance story a slightly different story, which is essentially the story, again, that I brought in which is the story of extracting subsidies. So you could think that these companies essentially are signaling some kind of type by showing that they are actually innovating, but maybe this is just greenwashing. Essentially, these companies are producing something which is, has a particular label and it's very good to actually extract resources from, but not necessarily something that they actually believe is benefiting that process. And again, it's a little bit of a cynical view and I don't want to be cynic here because I think that doesn't benefit everyone. But I think the fact that we don't observe the evidence on emission reduction, either at the individual company or at the aggregate sector level is a little bit of a red flag. That maybe the type of innovations that we promote, we can think about the scope of subsidies that have been channeled in many regions it's kind of not bearing the fruit that we would hope to actually observe, that these companies are actually doing what we want them uh, to do. And uh, you are absolutely right on this cost story. The story of the cost is quite important, and we don't want to deter innovation. We don't want to basically, these companies, not to have the resources to innovate. But I think that's the kind of why we have the subsidies in the first place. I think they are there because we want to kind of allow these leaders to essentially bypass this competitive pressure channel. So in this regard, public support is helpful, but I think it was important to recognize that it has to be more uh, concerted. On the issue of uh, regional variation, that's a great question. So maybe one thing to clarify that maybe has not come out of my talk. When I mentioned that we are looking at European Patent Office, 
that's not to imply that we are looking at European companies only. In our data set, you observe that global companies register their patents with the European uh, office. So essentially, you can have a company in North America, you can have a company in Asia, you can have a company in uh, Europe, and all these three companies register their patents with European Patent Office. So essentially, in our data, we observe all sorts of companies in different continents, and we did look a little bit at the question of uh, how does it vary across continents. I didn't show you that because I thought I would not have enough time, but essentially the evidence on that is that, generally speaking, no matter which uh, region you look at, the evidence on uh, decarbonization is pretty weak. Even in Europe, which typically is considered to be a much more forward-looking relative to other kind of domiciles, you don't find much of that evidence that decarbonization is seriously uh, taking uh, place. And again, it could be what you mentioned, this is your last point, that it takes time to implement. We, the way how we uh, classify here patent is at the time when the patent is actually approved. So at least the process of approval is already con controlled for. But of course, the adoption of patent is a separate question. In, in reality, it's very hard to observe when the technology is implemented in terms of the real investment. So that's the challenge of the data. This is something that hopefully central banks can help with by encouraging companies to disclose this kind of information. But broadly speaking, this kind of information is not available. But I want to raise that point that I mentioned earlier, that even if it takes time, we also need to think a little bit from the perspective of cost versus benefits. And if it takes so long to see the fruit of that, that we need to wait 10, 20 years to see materialization of these technologies, maybe promoting these technologies is simply too costly. And we don't have that time. I think we as a society, we know from climate scientists, we cannot wait 20 more years to basically solve the problem. We have much less time to do it, as such, I think time is not our friend here. We actually have a very limited time by which we can solve this problem. So, so we need to be really kind of thinking that this is going to take faster than more than five years to see actually the evidence of that. Thank you very much, Marcin. We have actually a question or more in the audience. So I would like the microphone to be passed to the to the people. Mm. Uh, Hello, thanks a lot. Uh, can you my please name state your name ah, yes. and affiliation? Uh, my, my name is Ben Hartung. I'm working in the market operations uh, director here in the ECB, and I have actually two questions. The one is a bit out of cura cur curiosity. Uh, I found it interesting that essentially you say that it's mostly firm fixed facts if you're uh, identifying who's, uh, who's innovating in the green space. And uh, I wonder whether that's specific to green innovation because there's also evidence that, on general, like most of the innovation is coming from new firms. Um, so I wonder whether you can see whether this is beyond what we see on average for innovation. Um, so whether there's a particular concern for, for green innovation. And the second question is um, on, uh, on let's say, your case or your, your narrative that uh, innovation doesn't help that much. My understanding is also that, essentially, it needs to be complemented by uh, uh, a biting tax on carbon, whether it's through a cap and trade system or a, a tax. Um, so I wonder how you see that, because ultimately, what I mean, it is not so surprising that if you don't have a, a have a tax on carbon, that at least part of the innovation windfall is, is is used for simply more consumption. So, so I wonder how you how you see the conjunction between the the carbon pricing and and the innovation. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you so much, and these are great comments and. Uh, on the first point, I think you are right that in some sense what we observe is that a little bit of this uh, dichotomy, which is uh, green companies are typically younger companies, and that's essentially promoting entry of new companies into this space is essentially going in the direction of promoting green innovation. That's kind of evidence. What's interesting about that is that it's really a selection process. It's not the fact that companies change themselves. So essentially, it's almost like your type is fixed ex ante, rather than you over time realize that you should be switching from one technology type to another technology type. So to us, this was a very interesting finding. We didn't expect that. We thought that in the way how the pressure is going to be applied on companies, they will have incentives to essentially change their type from being brown to being green. But what we observe is that essentially that either that adjustment cost is very high, 
or the incentives are not strong enough to, for the companies to do it. And I agree with you that looking at that question in more detail is definitely a very promising area to understand the problem. Right now we are highlighting the problem. And of course, we will do everything to understand the problem even better. On the second question, I mean, you are talking to a person who has exactly your view. I mean, maybe not exactly in terms of implementation, but I've done quite a bit of work on exactly kind of the question of what are the ways in which we should be thinking about uh, to address the decarbonization problem. And the way in which I have uh, conducted my research, mostly with Patrick, but also with others, was to think as a, essentially of what you call a carbon tax, but implemented from the perspective of the private sector. So thinking of essentially cost of capital channel as a potential channel in which companies are going to be incentivized to decarbonize. So of course, uh, there, there are different ways in which you can apply this tax. It can be applied uh, by uh, states, it can be applied by the markets, but I agree that the price kind of mechanism is a potentially useful thing. However, some of the evidence that we observe is that it may not be enough. So now the question is, is the failure of the problem because there is some leakage, like uh, say you go to other non-regulated jurisdictions, or maybe you have diversified operations and that's what uh, helps you kind of pass the cost somewhere else? Or is it because the cost is too small? I think we kind of had a little bit of that test recently where the ETS market has actually gone uh, uh, to higher prices and uh, we have seen that that kind of potentially has stalled some of the brown activities. But I think it is a question how high that cost should be and are we applying enough of that cost? An alternative of way, way of thinking about it is that maybe rather than thinking of the price-based system, we should think of the quantity-based system. So essentially, as I said, with the price-based system, the problem is that, uh, that you can always shift uh, business into something which is basically less cost-intensive. So think of a conglomerate company. If I have two units, one of them pro pollutes but is profitable, the other one doesn't pollute but is less profitable, if I impose the tax on the company as a whole, the company has an incentive to shift actually to the brown technology because that's essentially where the profit margin is higher. So they are going to resize itself in a way that is going to offset the cost that is basically born on that activity. So this is a little bit uh, of the leakage within the company boundaries. So, so I think the cap and trade system that we have as a quantity system is potentially better because it directly gets a quantity of emission rather than indirectly through the price mechanism. And my conclusion to all of this is that I think what we really need as a society is a mixed uh, approach, which is I don't think we have one particular tool that is going to solve all the problems. One of the failure of the environmental economics, as I can see it, is that we put so much faith on this carbon tax idea that that essentially led to inaction rather than action. The coordination costs were so high that we did not implement the solution in, a, in any sensible way. And we paid the price because time is a, a risk factor for us here. And rather than trying to finance the best possible solution, to me, the more kind of balanced approach where you engage many players at the same time and many tools at the same time, at least benefits that problem directly. Maybe more costly a solution, but I think if you think of lexicographic preferences and the idea that we want to solve the climate problem, that may be a more productive solution. Thank you, Marcin. There is another question, uh, Jean-David. Hello, I'm Jean-David Tigo with the CB. Great talk, um, Marcin. Thank you very much. I have a, a question on the Jevons uh, paradox, which uh, I didn't know uh, before this talk, and I, I find it uh, fascinating. So I, the way you presented the paradox is uh, it's crucial for the paradox to be there that the firm is sharing with the consumer the benefits of innovation. Okay. Imagine a monopoly firm that doesn't share anything, innovates, but just keep all the profits. There, in, in, in that case, I would think that the paradox is not there anymore or is attenuated. So could it be that if the paradox is very prevalent in, in the economy, could it be that monopoly, uh, monopoly firms uh, or monopolistic firms uh, would actually be uh, the, would lead to uh, less of a paradox and, and therefore 
a more decarbonization than um, competitive environments or competitive industries. And my question would be, could it be used to test uh, the prevalence of, of, of the paradox? Uh, have you thought about this? Um, thank you. I think this is a great question. Uh, I, I think uh, we thought a little bit about that. In general, I think this question of what the industrial organization is, is a very important question. And uh, we didn't do much in this paper, but I think overall, I think it's a very important question. On the issue, would it attenuate uh, Jevons paradox? It's possible, but I don't think I would put a limit case like the way you presented it, in a sense that think of a company like Apple. Apple produces a phone, right, which we know is uh, getting better and better. The battery lasts uh, longer. This is kind of what we consider the kind of uh, efficiency gain, essentially. And we observe that these Apple phones are basically demanded more and more. So, yes, we know that the gross of the profits goes to Apple because essentially Apple has become close to the monopoly in this kind of space. So, so, but at the same time, I don't think the society is actually uncomfortable with that particular proposition. We are all kind of comfortable with giving Apple this uh, profit share and essentially still consume the product. We are paying the price to essentially subsidize the company called Apple. Uh, so, so I agree with you that that margin matters. And it's, of course, the price mechanism uh, controls that. But at some level, uh, there is also some kind of uh, elasticity aspect of that. How much you are sensitive to your price and how far can you push that? So in this regard, I think this is where we need to think as a two-dimensional problem a little bit rather than just one-dimensional problem. But it's, I think it's a great uh, idea to think about the industry structure more broadly as a factor in this particular decarbonization effort. Absolutely. OK, thank you again, Marcin. So you are stirring a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in more uh, um, areas uh, of this uh, this uh, this field. I think one uh, two debates on which uh, probably your your findings, your keynote speech, your your research will have a, an impact uh, is the, um, the debate on uh, market neutrality, market efficiency. It was launched by Schoenmacher. Uh, 2018, 2019, is possibly on the fact that uh, um, the euro system being market neutral buys uh, 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 has a higher share in portfolio of uh, um, of high carbon uh, uh, companies, and that uh, we should uh, sort of uh, tilt our, 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 our portfolios toward the greener firms and so forth. So in a, in a way, you are taking some urgency some wind out of that debate eh? and then there is a, a, especially one uh, ECB board member that is very keen about the green capital market union so your evidence today where does it uh, leave us in terms of uh, okay pursuing market efficiency and uh, pushing for a green capital market union yeah, I, I think these are great comments, and uh, I, I am aware of the research that one of your uh, uh, ECB workers, Melina Papuzzi, has done with Monica Piazzesi and Martin Schneider on the neutrality. I think it's a fascinating research, and I agree that this idea of uh, neutrality in the context of uh, climate debate is, is an important one. I think, in general, I, on that first point, I definitely believe that we should promote companies that actually are more advanced in the decarbonization process. And we have such companies. So essentially what I think I'm trying to tell you is that there are different ways in which we think we can go to get to decarbonization. And many people think that technology is the one that is the leading one. And it doesn't seem to be the case that maybe this is what's happening. So. So that's kind of the view that I'm having. Uh, there could be other ways in which companies decarbonize, and the output is what matters, of course, at the end of the day. But for policymakers, it's important of where it is that we are going to provide the uh, stimulus, where it is that we are going to provide incentives. And I think that's kind of how I would like to view my research in the first kind of aspect of your uh, question. In terms of the Green Union, I fully agree with you on that. And for one simple reason, in my response to the earlier question about the carbon tax, I certainly believe that part of the failure that we have in this space is the coordination failure. So essentially, if we can think of coordinating action 
like how it is that we can uh, get more of the players engaged around this particular problem, there will be less evidence of some kind of leakage that uh, kind of destroys the effort of the leaders uh, and benefits the actually laggards. So this is what we don't want to observe. We don't want this problem to be pushed forward. As you said earlier, all these multinationals that can transfer their em emissions abroad, we don't want that to become basically a solution to the carbon problem because the carbon problem is not a one country's problem. It's a problem of the global world. As such, it doesn't matter where these emissions are actually produced. It matters that they are produced. So the more we tighten the structure in a way that it's harder to actually get around this problem, the more success I anticipate we are going to observe in solving this problem. So any efforts that go in that direction, I, I fully agree with you, are the efforts that are going to be actually beneficial. Okay, please join me in a round of applause uh, for Marcin. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Marcin, thank hope you. to see you again soon. Uh, thank you so much. We are taking now the lunch break for uh, one hour, so please reconvene here in about an hour. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much.